Good morning. The West Wing has to be one of my all-time favourite TV series. It's the fast-paced, hope-filled drama set in the White House. It's full of great dialogue and deep, rich character development. And the key to the whole programme has to be the relationships between the staff, who are basically friends trying their best to run a country together, governing under extreme pressure. In season two, Josh Lyman, the deputy chief of staff, is struggling. Months earlier, he's been the victim of a shooting which was aimed at the president's motorcade. And since then, his colleagues have become really concerned about his increasingly erratic behaviour. Most recently, he's turned up to work with a homemade messy bandage on his hand. He says that what happened was he, he put a whiskey glass down at home and he put it down too hard and it shattered in his hand and cut him. But it doesn't seem to add up. And his behaviour is getting worse and worse until eventually in the Oval Office of all places, he loses his temper and shouts at the president. You just don't do that. This causes the friends to have an intervention. They arrange for him to see a therapist without asking him. And as he emerges from the counselling session, he didn't even know he needed and he didn't even ask for. He finds his boss, Leo McGarry, sitting outside and waiting for him. Let's see what happens next. <laughs> How'd it go? Did you wait around for me? How'd it go? He thinks I may have an eating disorder. Josh. And uh, fear of rectangles. That's not weird, is it? I didn't cut my hand on a glass. I broke a window in my apartment. This guy's walking down the street when he falls in the hall. The walls are so steep he can't get out. A doctor passes by and the guy shouts up, Hey, you, can you help me out? The doctor writes a prescription, throws it down in the hole and moves on. Then a priest comes along and the guy shouts up, Father, I'm down in this hole, can you help me out? The priest writes out a prayer, throws it down in the hole and moves on. Then a friend walks by. Hey, Joe, it's me, can you help me out? And the friend jumps in the hole. Our guy says, Are you stupid? Now we're both down here. The friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. Long as I got a job, you got a job, you understand? I just think that's a beautiful moment. Here's Leo McGarry, the president's chief of staff, therefore one of the most important and powerful people and influential people in the world, just showing deep care and empathy for one of his staff, his friend, Josh. It transpires that Josh is suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and Leo actually knows all about it, having suffered from it himself as a Vietnam War veteran. Together, Leo and his staff help Josh to recover, and I just love the imagery of friendship being like jumping into the hole with your friends to help out and get out together. True friendship involves more than just throwing in a prescription like the doctor or offering up even just a simple prayer. True friendship actually involves action and sacrifice. And when Josh emerges from the room, he knows that Leo and the rest of the gang are right with him. Look, call me a sentimental old whatever, but I just love seeing beautiful friendship in action. And we're in a point now in our series on lessons in the life of King David where we get to really look at one of the most amazing friendships in Scripture, that between Jonathan and David. Remember, David is the anointed future king of Israel, the brave shepherd boy hand-picked by God, not because of his stature or his ability, but because of his heart and his character. He's the man who's, who's become a good warrior as well. But he's not king yet, and King Saul, the first ever king of Israel, is still on the throne. And as we saw last week when Matt so helpfully explained chapter 18 to us, we see there's a very complicated relationship that's formed between Saul and David. On one minute, Saul loves David and, and he, he sees him as a great comfort and, and he leads him into worship. David comforts him by playing the harp for him. And the next minute, Saul has lost his rag with him and he's trying to kill him, throwing spears left, right and centre. Out of this very complex and dangerous relationship, though, we see a beautiful friendship form. Jonathan, Saul's son and the, the original heir to the throne before David was anointed, he's not like his father. 
He sees the character of David. He sees what God has done in his life and he loves him and he, and he pledges allegiance to him. They form this unlikely, deep and sacrificial and secure friendship, which involves great risk and cost for both of them. But it helps David to survive the physical and mental torment of having a powerful king on the loose to try and kill him. The story of their friendship continues to unfold in today's chapters, 1 Samuel 19 and 20. I'm really sorry I don't have time to read out every verse this morning, but I'm going to guide us through it. And as we go, I'm going to pluck out some of the key aspects of this friendship, which I just love. We're going to start at the beginning of 1 Samuel 19, where we see Jonathan as a friend who advocates. Here we see Jonathan coming to David and warning him that Saul still wants him dead. But Jonathan volunteers to advocate and intercede on David's behalf. He tells David, you go and hide and I will speak to my father. And in verse four, we see the conversation he has. He says to Saul, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel and you saw it and were glad. So why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? This is true friendship. When seeing David under threat, Jonathan intervenes. He stands in the gap between him and Saul and takes action to try and change Saul's heart towards David. There's huge power in having a friend speak up on your behalf. I sometimes get to do this in my role as a church leader. Sometimes I get to write references with people to get a job or or to get someone's child into a a certain school. And I get to have the privilege of, of... taking a pen and paper and writing down and saying, this is what's awesome about this person. I I can only say good things about this person. They'd be a great asset to your school or your workplace. And it's great to have someone do that for you. It can have a real effect. There's huge power on someone speaking up on your behalf. And here, Jonathan does that for David. He speaks up and he reminds Saul of David's heroics with Goliath and of his innocence. And Saul is actually persuaded He even takes an oath that he will not allow David to be put to death. But it doesn't last for long. Soon after the war with the Philistines reignites, David goes off. Once again, he's the war hero and Saul just can't take it. He's jealous, he's insecure, he's angry and he tries once again to kill David. In the rest of chapter 19, we see David making various escapes. First, he escapes to Michael, his wife, Saul's daughter, who helps him to escape when Saul sends more men to try and kill him. Then he escapes to the safety of Samuel, the prophet. And again, Saul comes after him first by sending a a, a hunting party and then going after him himself. Eventually, David is forced to flee back to Jonathan. But Jonathan has been his advocate. The next thing we see about Jonathan's friendship with David is that he is a friend who offers protection. In 1 Samuel 20 verses 1 to 4, we see this aspect. We see David despairing as Saul is out to kill him again, but Jonathan bringing reassurance of protection. He says to David in verse 2, never, you are not going to die. And then in verse 4, he says, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, uh, sorry, he says, wherever you want me to do, I will do for you. He actually, he promises, I'm not going to let this happen. I am going to protect you. David's paralysed with fear, understandably, because Saul is trying to kill him, but Jonathan remains confident it will not come to that. And in that, we see another aspect. We see that Jonathan is a friend who helps David to to just cling on to the promises of God. Remember, David has been promised the kingship by God. That should be enough to get through the situation. He should know, look, it's okay. God's promised me I'm going to be king. Saul isn't going to affect that. But instead, he believes and fears more Saul's promise to kill him than God's promise to make him king. uh, Jonathan helps bring him back from the brink of that. He helps to say, look, no, this isn't going to happen. My father is not going to kill you and I will do whatever it takes to help you. Jonathan is the friend who protects. Jonathan is also the friend who keeps his promises. In the next chunk of scripture, chapter 20, verses 5 to 23, we see Jonathan uh, as a faithful promise keeper. He makes a covenant with David to find out for certain what Saul is planning next. David isn't sure at this stage in the story, is Saul still trying to kill him or is he safe now? And so they come up with this scheme to safely try and find out if David can go back to being in in Saul's presence again. They plan around the new moon feast. This is a feast where David should be present with Saul, but he's too scared to attend. So they agree that Jonathan will go and he'll cover for David's absence and he'll see what Saul's reaction is to this. And by that, they'll be able to find out, is it safe for David to return 
or not and he makes this vow I'm going to do this for you David I won't let you down and in verse 23 chapter 20 he says this remember the Lord is witness between you and me forever he makes a solemn sacred covenant with God to look after and to align himself to David for life it's not like Saul, the previous chapter, where he's made an oath not to kill David, which is just his own word, which is worth nothing, and he breaks it at the drop of a hat. No, Jonathan makes a God covenant with David, and it can be trusted. He's the, he's the friend who will keep his promise. The final thing we see in Jonathan's friendship with David in these two chapters is that he's a friend who's willing to risk his life for David. Jonathan, in, in, in coming up with this plan and enacting it, he puts himself in great danger. Jonathan knows better than anyone how volatile, how insecure, how dangerous Saul is. And by going in and by telling Saul that David isn't coming to the feast, he's putting himself in danger. He knows it's probably going to arouse Saul's anger and jealousy even more. So, And that's exactly what happens. He goes to the feast. Saul asks where David is. Jonathan tells him. And what happens in verse 33? It says this. Saul held his spear at Jonathan to kill him. Now, thankfully, Jonathan escapes, but he was willing to, to go into that place. He was willing to risk his life for his friend, David. However, we must note something here. But we're not, let's not get too carried away with just how amazing this friendship is. It's a good friendship. But actually, in doing this, Jonathan and David led each other into sin. You see, this whole plan of testing out whether, whether Saul is going to be angry or not is based on a lie. When Jonathan goes to the dinner, Saul says to him, Where's David? And so, and Jonathan says what he's agreed with David that he's going to say. He says, look, he, he wanted to come, but he said he has to be excused because he wanted to go to a family sacrifice back in his hometown. And that's where he is. It's a barefaced lie. David is not at a family sacrifice in his hometown. He's outside waiting to find out what's happening next. It's, it's a bit of a mess, really. Jonathan and David have, have concocted a lie. They don't trust enough in God's power to liberate David from Saul. Instead, they have to try and lie to him uh, in order to try and see what happens next. And actually, all that happens is the lie makes the situation worse. Saul is angrier than he was before. He nearly kills Jonathan and David has to flee for his life once again. Who knows what might have happened if they just trusted in God's promise and, and not lied to Saul. Jonathan is a great friend to David but he's not a perfect friend. I wonder how you're feeling as we look at this incredible friendship. Perhaps right now you're thinking of friends in your life who you've cherished much and, and just, just as David cherishes Jonathan, maybe you're just thinking, I'm, I'm thanking God, God, thank you for the friend you put in my life. Maybe like me, added to that, you're, you're lamenting that some of the, the very closest in your friends of your friends right now are, are distanced through this lockdown period we're unable to spend time with some of the people that we love the most some of our dearest friends I'm unable to spend quality time with my mates at the moment and it's really hard I'm finding that a painful thing maybe you're in that position too and as you think of Jonathan and David's friendship it's making you miss the friendships you have perhaps on another level you you've actually when you think about it you've you're thinking about friendships that you've lost Friendships that haven't been based on the same trust and promises that Jonathan and David had. Maybe a friend that let you down. Maybe you let a friend down. And as you're listening to this, you're filled with regret and sadness and pain at that. Or maybe even worse, maybe you've never known the kind of friendship that Jonathan and David had. Maybe at the moment, you're, what you're feeling is loneliness as you, as you reflect and think, I, I don't have a friend like these guys had in each other. And I'm, I'm sad about that. Well, what I want to do is to use the remaining time this morning to, to show you that as good as this friendship is between Jonathan and David, there is a true and better friendship in the Bible, which is one that we can all participate in, one that we can all enjoy, and one that will never, ever let us down. You see, Jonathan is a good advocate, but in the Bible, there is a true and better friend who is the ultimate advocate. Jonathan is able in 1 Samuel 19 to achieve a temporary truce through his advocation with Saul, speaking on David's behalf. He sees Saul change his heart for a while, but he's then powerless when Saul actually just throws it all away and becomes jealous of David again and tries to kill him. In the Bible, though, we have Jesus, a true and better advocate, a faithful friend who advocates for us in a way which will never fail. Saul is the unreliable and insecure father, but when Jesus goes to his father, he goes to a father who is loving and utterly trustworthy and holy. 
David is threatened with death, and it's an undeserved death actually that the soul is threatening with, and and it's and it's a death that comes from a wicked and insecure king. We too, all of humanity, the Bible says, are facing death. But unlike David, our death is deserved. Our death and our, is, is based on our sin. It's based on the fact that we've rebelled against God and that God is holy and just and the righteous and just punishment for sin and rebellion is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. It's what a holy, loving God has to do in response to rebellion against him. But Jesus is our true and better friend and advocate. And he advocates for us and he pays the price for our sin himself. He came to earth, he lived a perfect sinless life. He suffered on the cross and died for our sin. And he, and when we appear before God guilty and shamed, Jesus stands in our place and advocates for us. And God looks at Jesus and can say, oh, I can pour my punishment out on you instead. You can take it. You can, you've done it for me. And I don't need to punish these people. I, I'm satisfied that you have taken the punishment for them. 1 John 2 1 describes Jesus as an advocate with the Father, the righteous one. We have a true and better friend, a true and better advocate. When God sees Jesus, he sees the incredible, sinless sacrifice he makes and he is satisfied. His anger and his punishment are dealt with. He no longer needs to pour out on us. And we have the promise, the unbreakable promise, not like Saul's oath. We have the promise of eternal life if we put our trust in him. Jesus is the true and better protector. Jonathan offered protects us, but Jesus is a true and better friend who offers even better eternal protection. Jonathan promises to David that he won't die and that he will be loyal to him, but he's unable to truly remove the threat of death, not forever anyway. So David does eventually die. And ultimately, when, when Jonathan promises that Saul's not going to kill him, he actually makes Saul madder and he tries even harder to kill him. But the Bible points to Jesus, who is the true and better friend, who provides reliable, eternal protection. Jesus himself says in John 10, verses 28 to 30, I give them eternal life, that is, anyone who puts his, their trust in him, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. This is the promise made to Jesus, made by Jesus to anyone who puts their trust in him. A promise of eternal security. See, once we're saved by faith in his death and resurrection, we will never leave that place of favour with him. Jesus is the true and better friend who promises eternal security. Jesus is a true and better friend who also is not only like Jonathan, a friend who can keep a promise. He is the fulfilment of promises. Jesus is the promised King and Messiah, the Saviour God promised to Israel and to the world. Later on in our series, we'll see God make a promise to David. He promises that he will raise up someone in his family line in the future who would establish his kingdom forever. That's a promise further revealed through the prophets like Isaiah in Isaiah 9, who says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the prophets further reveal that this son, this king, will be a suffering servant, sacrifice for his people, and who will provide healing and redemption through his suffering. And in the Gospels, we see this promised king arrive. It's Jesus of Nazareth. He lives, he dies, he rises again. Paul, the apostle, is able to say about Jesus in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding Yes, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. Jonathan is a friend who makes and even keeps some promises. Jesus is the fulfilment of promises. He's the true and better friend who does much more than any other friend can do for us with promises. Finally, the final thing we see about Jesus is that uh, where Jonathan is a friend who's willing to risk his life, Jesus is the true and better friend who willingly gives up his life completely. Jonathan puts himself at risk in the hope that David might be free, but actually all it achieves is to make Saul madder and put David at even greater risk. Jesus goes way further. He gives up his position in heaven to come to earth and to live as one of us and to die for us. 
like the friend in Leo's story from the Westman scene earlier. Jesus sees us in a mess, estranged from God, unable to do anything about the situation ourselves, but rather than just throwing down a prescription like a doctor or even just offering up a prayer like a good Christian, he gets into our mess. He climbs down into our hole and he enters our world and he lives a perfect life and he dies and he brings us out, having defeated our greatest enemy, our own sin and the death that comes as a result of it. Jesus willingly gave up his life. He suffered the most brutal death so that we could go free from sin and death. Jesus is the heir who didn't see his position in heaven as something to cling to and protect, but gave it up and sacrificed himself. Jesus himself says, greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. There is no more profound act of love that can be done for you than to have a friend die for you. And that is what Jesus did for you and for me. He is the true and better sacrifice. In closing then, I want to commend to you the example of David and Jonathan. as a great friendship. There's lots we can learn from them and hopefully emulate. But what I really want you to leave with this morning is to have your attention drawn to the incredible friendship of Jesus. The true and better advocate, the true and better protector, the true and better fulfilment of promises and the true and better sacrifice. You will hopefully have many friends in this world who you'll get to share and enjoy life with. You'll be able to bless and encourage and and you'll receive back from them too. Please do that at this time, especially this time of COVID-19. We need our friendships more than we need them ever before. It's difficult times. But also know this, there is no friendship on earth that can be greater than the friendship that is available to us through our saviour, our true and better friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want to leave you with too much of a soppy, sentimental image of Jesus. He's not some cuddly teddy bear forever friend with rainbows and lollipops. In C.S. Lewis's masterpiece, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, we see Aslan as a lion who effectively represents Jesus in what is basically an allegory. Upon learning that he is a lion, not a man, Susan speaks to uh, Mr. Beaver and she says, look, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I'll feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. See, friendship with Jesus isn't about cuddly, warm safety. Friendship with Jesus should change our lives. It will cost us a lot, but it will also reward us even greater. He encourages us to follow his example, to take up our cross and follow him. It's a road marked with pain and suffering. It's a death and resurrection road for us as much as it is for him. There'll need to be things that he puts to death in us, patterns of sin and shame that we need to die to, but then to be brought to fullness and resurrection. He needs to do open heart surgery on us at times. But there's the promise of this glorious resurrection, the promise of a future with God in eternity, to be spent with God, with Jesus, enjoying the full rights and riches of sons and heirs of the almighty God. So let me ask you this this morning. Are you ready to embark and enjoy the most radical friendship of your life, a friendship that offers life in abundance, navigating the heights and depths of life with the most wonderful, powerful, trustworthy friend you can think of? A friend who, even though you've already let him down in innumerable ways, and you will still, he has never stopped loving you. And he died for you, regardless. I want to finish us this morning by just bringing us to a place of, of worship, to be honest, a place where we just we just gaze upon our friend Jesus and worship him together. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, one of the greatest preachers of all time, uh, Charles Spurgeon. In 1893, he wrote a beautiful sermon comparing the love of Jonathan to the love of Jesus. He reflected on the fact that later on in Jonathan's, well, Jonathan actually dies later on, spoiler alert, um, and David pours out his heart about it and and he reflects on the love of Jonathan as being wonderful and as being greater than the love of a woman or as of a wife or of a mother. And Spurgeon reflects on this, he says this, and as, as I do this, just, just imagine yourself, as Spurgeon says, just, just come with me. Just imagine yourself at the foot of the cross, gazing upon Jesus, your friend. Let us think of Christ as present here tonight. For so he is, according to his promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. There he stands, with closed eyes. Faith perceives him and she cries, your love to me was wonderful. 
I think that what we feel that we feel this the most when we see our Saviour die. Sit down at the foot of the cross and look up. Behold that sacred brow with the thorny wreath upon it. See those blessed eyes red with weeping. Mark those nailed hands that once scattered benedictions. Gaze on those bleeding feet which hurried on errands of mercy. Watch till you can peer into that gaping side. How deep the gash, how wide the breach. Look how the water and the blood come streaming forth. This is the Lord of life and glory who thus dies amid derision and scorn. Suffering, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Oh, if you can picture Christ on the cross and believe that he died for you, you will be led to cry. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of mothers or of wives. Your love to me was, I cannot describe what it was, it was wonderful. As full of wonders as the heavens are full of stars or as a forest is full of leaves. Your love as I see it in your death, was wonderful. Friends, your invitation awaits to enjoy this friendship. If you're a Christian this morning, you have that friendship already. Press into it at this time. Just spend some quality time with your friend, your dear, true and better friend, the friend who has changed your life, who has promised you eternity with him. Let's spend some time just loving him this morning and worshiping him together as we finish. And if you don't know Jesus as your friend, as your savior this morning, there's an opportunity to do that. He loves you. He sees you in your sinful state. He sees you even though you don't deserve to be united with God. Jesus died for you to make it possible he wants to have a friendship and a relationship with you don't miss this opportunity this morning repent of your sin accept the love and the sacrifice of jesus for you and enjoy eternal life with him